Tail Rendezvous host, Bruce Hutchin, welcomes you to episode number 138. Welcome to Whitetail Rendezvous podcast, where it is all about whitetail deer hunting tips, techniques, and the stories so you can become a more successful whitetail deer hunter. And now your host, Bruce Hutchin. Tori Campisi joins us from rural Pennsylvania. He grew up in a hunting family that wasn't. Yes, his entire family in rural Pennsylvania did not hunt. At 20 years old, Tony said, I'm going to start hunting. He taught himself everything he could. He listened to seminars, DVDs, watched DVDs of hunting shows, attended seminars, and jammed everything he could in the last few years so he could go out and successfully harvest a whitetail buck. We'll let Tony tell you about the story coming up. He now spends his hunting season following the action, hunting wherever I feel like or whenever my friends or brothers can go hunting. After I started hunting, I began to influence many people locally, including my brothers, to get into hunting. Honey actually saved my three brothers and my relationships with each other. And my blog post published on OurTimeOutdoors.com explains that in full detail. I'm excited to have Tony on the show. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. And this is your host, Bruce Hutchin. And uh, we're heading to, into the end of the year. In fact, this is uh, December 31st, 2015. You'll be probably hearing this show uh, sometime late January or, uh, or mid-February. But today, ladies and gentlemen, we're heading to Pennsylvania, and we're going to chat with Tony Campisi. Is that right, Tony? Yes, sir. Campisi, yep. Camp easy. And you're in for a treat, ladies and gentlemen, because this this young man and I'm he's under thirty and over twenty, so pick a pick a year, but this man <laughs> really um plays out of everybody's sandbox. Uh he's got a different slant in things and you're you know, in the warm up he shared some things with me. I went, Really? And uh he's an interesting guy, so without further ado, Tony Campisi, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, man. Hey, let's just start right off with your number one, and I think it's important for everybody in North America to understand how important conservation is. So I want to get Toby Campisi's sl- uh, uh, eyes on it or, or uh, uh, take on what conservation really is and how it's integrated to everything of our life. Right. Well, first of all, I truly do believe that our that as a as a human race, we are we are dependent on the natural world. And if you think about it, if you think about what do we really need, we need clean water to drink, we need clean food to eat, and we need clean air to breathe. All of those require stewardship of the land that we live on. There are a lot of people, I think, that just believe that development can be a ruthless uh, pursuit and and have this idea, well, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. And I think that that's a big problem today because... In the past 100 years, you know, up until the year about 2000 in the Industrial Revolution, we did a ton of damage. I wasn't even around during that time, but the Industrial Revolution and the the uh, ruthless development did a ton of damage. Now we've gotten to a point where we are going out of that economy, we're going out of that time, and we really do have an opportunity to make a huge difference for the next 100 years. And... It really is so connected to everything is, is, is really connected. There was a study done. I forget what scientist did it. I forget his name. Um, Mon Boyd, I think it was his last name, George. And he did a study in, I believe it was Yellowstone National Park, where they actually took the wolves out of the park, I'm guessing to make it more safe for guests. And they noticed over the year that the deer population would go up. And, the, and then the uh, the deer would eat everything 
as they do now, why it's so important to manage the deer herds now. But they would eat everything, all the all the browse, and then the birds would leave because they'd have nowhere to go. The bears would leave because they'd have nothing to eat, and it turned into like a barren wasteland, basically. And then they used a... They used a, uh, they, they reintroduced the wolves to, to see if, see what would happen. And the amazing thing was is that when the wolves came back, they started to eat the deer. They started to, and then the deer population wasn't able to eat all the browse anymore and the birds returned and the, the banks of the stream became thicker and the rivers slowed down and they started to to flow more evenly and the fish were healthier and the bears returned because they could eat the fish and the berries and everything everything was connected in conservation especially in the hunting industry hunters and fishermen do more for conservation than any organization because they understand the connection between everything how it's connected and 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 what the basically what what's going to happen if we get things out of balance i guess so i think with this new with this new uh economy people are either i believe that the 40 hour work week is completely dead i believe people are either going to be working 80 hours or they're going to be working about 15 to 20 hours there's going to be a lot more time to focus for the people who really care about this stuff to focus, and we can really make a difference in the next 100 years. And listeners, I just want to share, um, you know, a, a lot of different viewpoints will be heard on Whitetail Run, but but Tony is a hunter. He he hunts and he harvests and he puts whitetails down. And so if, if there's a question in anybody's mind, um, this will get into his honey uh, experiences, but I wanted to share uh, a really defined slant on how we're connected through conservation, through the help of our forests, our streams, and actually, in my belief, our, our way of life. It's all connected in a natural way. Absolutely. And and hunters, and I would never be able, we would never be able to... Uh to to get out there after whatever animals that we're pursuing if if conservation was not a constant focus of of people and that is really what you're when 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 we're buying our licenses and we're buying you know stamps and licenses and all that kind of stuff that's where your money is going i mean it's it's going to conservation so absolutely hunting is as a hunter that's what has built my passion for for conservation conserving the natural life i mean Conserving the natural world. Without a natural world, we have no hunting. And listeners, uh, Tony's going to share his hunting tradition, and uh, it's surprising because he's in his mid-20s, and nobody in his family hunted. So, Tony, uh, talk to us about how you began your own hunting tradition. Right. Uh, well, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, and anybody who knows Pennsylvania is has a strong, strong hunting tradition. So I grew up all around. I mean, I was surrounded by it all the time. Kids would come into school late if they even came in at all. We have off in Pennsylvania on the first day of rifle season. I mean, it's literally a statewide holiday. We are surrounded by hunters we would see bucks hanging off of the trees and stuff in the in the in the winter and the fall and it always intrigued me i always liked the idea of getting out there and and killing my own food because i knew i had to eat and i thought well this is i've always been a sustainable minded person i thought this is this is how i got to do it but it's so it is really intimidating to get into hunting with all the rules and regulations and gear and all that kind of stuff so i didn't get into hunting like uh like we said there's no hunters on my mother's side of the family and my father's side of the family on either side i mean there's 30 40 people in total it's a very large family but none of them were hunters so actually in when i turned 20 when i developed the confidence i actually wrote about this on my blog i d- developed the confidence to go out and and learn this all by myself i went and got a, a license and i just went into the woods basically no one was there the whole time the first year i didn't see a thing i mean it was just a big learning process and i've read and and studied and it really was a a big uh commitment to just learn Pretty much everything myself. What was the name of that blog? 
Uh, the blog is tcampeasy.com. I write, I write articles on that blog. So that is one. I actually wrote a, uh, an article called How I Learned to Hunt a New Species of Wild Game. And it just goes through the, the, the process that I developed out of necessity to learn how to hunt. Cause I, w- I was never a one, a one season hunter. I was never a one species hunter. So to learn how, and then I explained a little bit more on that. So that article was called How I Learn to Hunt on a New Species of Wild Game. Thanks for that. Let's jump right into, uh, I'm reading your bio and um, an amazing story and a big mature seven-point buck was the first experience I had with killing a deer. Uh, take us through that. Take us through what led up to you getting the shot, and then let's talk about the after shot. Right. Well, I this was, I believe, the third year into – I never – I didn't rifle hunt at all. I only got into bow hunting. And I – it was the third year, and – or no, the second year, I guess it was. And I was hunting a private piece of property. I had permission. Um, it was a buddy of mine. His father gave me permission to hunt on his property. And it was actually a – it's an, actually a very, very large – piece of property that was not used for anything. It was really overgrown and it was it was like an enormous 500 acre bedding area for the most part. I mean, it literally looked like a maze. There were trails going in every direction, but it was so thick that you couldn't hardly see anything unless you sat on the outer rims and watched, you know, the deer come in and out of the fields. And we had been watching a six point come in and out during the morning and actually my younger brother almost he 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 drew on it held it and I was glassing it and I wanted to make sure he took a safe shot on a legal buck because we do have antler restrictions here and I didn't decide that until it was too late and he ran away but we seen him a couple times and I sat there throughout the morning this was the day I committed to sit all day because that's what I read I read during the rut you want to sit all day this was November 11th And I was sitting on the outer rim of this huge, or outer edge of this huge property. And I had seen nothing that day. It was actually quite warm. I think it got up to 62 degrees in November. And that's not typical. This year it has been, but it's not typical. Um, And after, at at about 10 o'clock in the morning, I decided... I remembered something that I had read, and they said that the big boys always come out in the middle of the day, and like the ones that you'll never see otherwise. And he said that most people will leave the stand and go get lunch or whatever. I forget where I read this, but I remembered it. It stuck out. Most people go out of the you know go out of the woods, come back in the evening. So I went, and I just started bushwhacking into the thickest part of this property I could possibly find. And as I was walking, I looked down this, uh, it's basically what used to be a Christmas tree farm. It's so thick, but this was like a tractor path kind of in the middle. And in, in this tractor path, the grass was up to my chest. I saw two ears looking straight at me. And I pulled out my binoculars. I saw a doe. And I looked at her. She didn't get up. And I said, okay, well, if I walk anymore, I might spook her. And I heard that big bucks travel around the court, the uh, the bedding areas to find the doe in the middle of the day. Remember, I had nobody to tell me this. So I was really just going off of books that I had read. And, and this is just basically what I learned out of books. No one ever told me this. So I said, I'm going to sit down right here. I can see her. When I sit down, I'm not going to be able to see her, but I know she's there. So if a buck comes from my left or comes through her and, and pops her up, he might follow her and come out right in front of me. So I sat there for quite a few, for a couple hours. It was up until I think 1.15, I heard some rustling about 50 yards away. And I see some movement, and then I see in my naive eyes what looks like what looks like a moose running through. I mean, it is it is wide and and just just huge. I mean, I was so excited. My heart was literally beating out of my chest, but he wasn't even close to me yet. But I was thinking, this is the biggest deer that I have ever seen alive. Nobody I've ever met has shot a deer bigger than this, and this is the first deer I'm ever going to even be able to pull my bow back on. This is insane. So I hit, hit my grunt a few times. 
about 10, 15 minutes go by and nothing. I hear nothing. So, sure enough, within 10 minutes, I literally am sitting four yards from a trail. A doe comes flying down that trail, just panting, panting four yards. I mean, I could have reached out and grabbed her tail. She looks at me and she spooks and she runs straight up into the trees, straight up into the woods. I mean, there's literally woods right to my right shoulder. I'm sitting right along an edge. There's a little clearing and then thick, thick, thick stuff to my left. I mean, it is literally right in the thick of it, right in the middle. So there's not very much room at all. And I'm thinking this buck is going to be right on her tail and he's going to end up four yards in front of me. And I'm just, I'm just going nuts. So I put my, uh, I clip my, uh, release onto my D loop, whatever that thing is called on your bow. And I am just shaking. I am shaking like crazy. And I just know it's going to happen. And sure enough, this buck comes flying out of the trees, nose to the ground. He does not even look at me. I'm sitting on the ground. I'm not in a stand. I'm literally sitting in the ground. He comes. I, I'm getting kind of. <laughs> I'm getting excited talking about it right now. <laughs> so am I. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. He comes that nose to the ground. He is not looking at me at all. He is he is dead focused. And he runs. He comes across this field. So I'm drawn on him the whole time. But there's grass in the way the whole time. All I can see really is his horns and his, and his back, the antlers and the, and the back. And he comes out into this tiny little clearing four yards away. I mean, I can see every detail of his hair i can see his i mean his rack is enormous he's there with he's moving he slows down for one instant and starts to turn his head and that's when i let the let the arrow fly the arrow flies sounds like smacking a pig with a baseball bat i see the arrow stick out the other side and get caught on a tree pulled off the arrow is sitting six yards away from me i hear the deer crash through the trees run up i hear nothing i sit there for some time and that was that was pretty much it i left about that time came out of the woods told the homeowner the guy the, the property owner hey i just got a big one it was so hot that day i actually went home and changed real quick because i knew we were going to be tracking and about 2 30 we started tracking again and i don't know how far you want me to get into this story without intervening well, just I, you know, I, I know how it turns out. So just, mm -hmm. just say um, what you did. You went home, a couple right. of hours intervened, and then just pick us up when you went back. Right. Okay. So I, I get back. It's like I said, it is so warm that day. I actually got a cooler full of ice, and we are, we all go, we all head out. It's about, I would say, it's about three thirty in the afternoon. And we find the arrow. The arrow is covered in blood and hair from, you know, point to fletchings. And we start to, you know, look for a trail, look for signs of where this, where this big buck went. And we grab some, the homeowner grabbed some toilet paper and we were finding literally droplets of blood. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, I mean, I was excited about it because I had never done it before, but I could tell the, the, the ones that were there, like um, the guy's name is Mark, and then we actually called in another guy named Mike. They said that they were just sounding just not just not very encouraging about it. They were thinking maybe it was a bad shot or or maybe it was because I was sitting down. It didn't. There was nowhere for the blood to come out and and whatever. There was just uh, it was just kind of a, a negative uh, feeling I was getting from them. So we searched and searched and searched. We we tracked it for about two hundred yards. And we were on our hands and knees for hours. I think I left that night at 10 hours after it got dark. We called in another guy. His name was Mike. We combed back and forth through it. I mean, if you can imagine, this was a Christmas tree farm. So you could see in about, you could see five feet in any direction, and that was it. I mean, it was so stinking thick. And we tracked this 200 yards, and we lose blood. We left the paper there. I came home. It was not supposed to rain that night, so I thought, I'm going to go out again tomorrow morning. I went again, out again with a buddy. We tracked another We tracked another day. 
back and forth, comb this area back and forth, up to about 400, 450 yards away from the shot. We did it another half of a day, and then that, that on that third day, the half of the day, after calling everybody I knew, people had, I was convinced, based on what everyone was saying, that the deer had run away. And and that it, it was either a, a non-fatal shot or it had run. Some people were telling me it could have ran five to ten miles, and I was just so unbelievably devastated with myself. I mean, I was just it did it. I was never a trophy hunter. I never. I I'm not. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It was just. It wasn't about the size of the deer. It was the fact that I was out there, and it was a. It was amazing. It was exciting that I was able to get such a to shoot such a big deer. But it was. It was depressing at the same time because I was unable to find it. I just couldn't help but think what was going on with it. So, uh, about a month and a half goes by, and. I didn't. I I sacrificed my buck tag because I just couldn't. I was not going to be. Sh- and I, that was actually the only tag I had. I didn't get a doe tag that year, so I was only. I wasn't going to be archery or deer hunting at all the rest of that year. And about a month and a half later, a couple weeks before Christmas, my brother is still in school, and he sends me a text and says, "Look at this deer my buddy found." on this property is this the one that you shot and at first i was thinking okay well i don't know who this is i don't know if there was anything i was still getting used to the laws and all that and i was thinking i might be in some trouble because i don't know i didn't know there was anyone even allowed to hunt there so i'm like who found this how can i talk to this person i call this guy he's like hey i I found this big deer, and and if I had ever shot this and I couldn't find it, I would want the guy who who did shoot it to get it. And he said, I'm just trying to figure out whose it was. I've had this at my house for a a week or so, and I said, take me where where you found it, and and, and I'll tell tell you what I know about it. So we go back up there, walk the same exact path, except for we walk about 100 yards outside of where we where we stopped long after we decided that it was gone and we found i mean that's where he found it he found it i ended up taking it home it was it was an emotional time because what i was what i i kind of justified it in my heart like oh maybe it never died maybe it was just fine maybe i'll see it later on in the year maybe i'll see it next year and I found out that it did. It, it, uh, it ultimately did die somewhere on that trail that it was running that we were tracking. And I and I really didn't do my do the due justice that that deer deserved. And it taught me a lot about about tracking. It taught me a lot about what is actually possible in the woods. I hear a lot of people online today that say they track it for 50 yards and if they don't find blood or whatever, it's it's definitely still alive. And I just, I, I would just urge you to reconsider that, not to say it's going to go to waste because it definitely didn't go to waste. I mean, it was picked absolutely clean. You could tell the coyotes and the foxes enjoyed it. But the fact that you're out there for a reason, don't give up as easily as I did. I know it was three days, but it's still, it was just, it was just outside of our reach that it ended up dying. It ended up, you know, dying right outside a hundred yards, which really in, in hunting, that's not that much. But anyway, I think that basically sums that story up. And I hope that somebody could maybe a new hunter that, that might not know, too much about tracking you know just go a little bit further a little bit further and the the good chances are you could find the deer that you think has got away thanks for sharing that with us and um you know uh an honest portrayal what has happened to anybody uh who's hunted with a rifle muzzleloader crossbow uh compound bow um you know or or longbow um it ha- it happens and you know one thing that i found uh the most important thing is is to really watch your arrow hit the deer uh or your bullet hit the deer. And mm-hmm. from that, you really know, you know, where, you know, what it, what it's done to the animal because 
we hunt elk out here, and I've had guys shoot shoot elk with magnums, and the elk just runs away, like quarter mile, half a mile, and is running away. And the guy just looks at his gun and says, "How could he do that?" I said, "Well, you didn't hit him exactly where you needed to hit him to, you know, to to put him down, and right. he's going to die, and we'll find him, but you know, uh, it's going to take work." And it, it, that's the biggest thing I found. And then the other thing is, um, I don't know, did you smell your arrow or you just look at yeah. blood? Yeah, what kind of blood did. was on the arrow? What kind it, of blood was on the arrow? It was, it was, uh, they said it was a little bit darker than what they were looking for, but it wasn't so dark and it didn't smell like it went through the guts. They said it could have been because of, I had a 20 yard pin on. My top pin was a 20 yard pin. I shot it at 40 or four yards. So what we're assuming was it hit high, which, you know what I mean? Like it would have shot high because it's compensating. The 20 yard pin would have been compensating for it to be applying 20 yards. Sure. But it was, what it was, you know, it was so close that, I mean, it was just, it was crazy how close it actually came. And that was, that was a novice mistake. I mean, that was, that was my fault. I should have, I should have been able to, uh, calculate that, but I wasn't, the, <laughs> to be honest, well, no. the last thing I was thinking was, oh, it's closer than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, that, that's insane. And that happens, you know, in elk hunting more times than not. I mean, you'll have an elk literally inside of 10 yards and it's like, Oh my goodness! What am I going to do now? And a lot yeah. of times they're head they're head on, and you can't take the shot. But nonetheless, nonetheless, let's talk about um, anything is possible. Your dream, your journey, your passion. What does that mean to you? Well, what this did for me was, I used to think that hunting was something that you that you learned that was passed down through the generations and and I don't know why I was convinced of that but I I guess it was cuz I was raised with it I didn't know any any kids that hunted or fished or did anything like that like those traditional outdoor activities without a father grandfather or uncle or mother or or aunt or whatever it may be some mentor pouring into their early career in the outdoors. I didn't what what this taught me was that anything is possible if you have number one, you have a dream and you're willing to do the work to get it. Anything I mean, anything is possible. You can I mean that this is it was so simple. Everything in life really is so simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. It, all it took was for me to go get a hunter safety course, learn, read in books, how do you kill a deer, where do you find the deer, you know, how to get permission to hunt places. I mean, it really is that simple. It's not easy. Don't mistake it and say that it's easy it's, or that I'm saying that anything in life is easy. Anything in life that's worth it is not easy. But it's simple in the fact that if you break it down, Anything is really possible, and this is just so much bigger than hunting. I mean, hunting has been a – I have since, you know, got into waterfowl hunting by myself, you know, pheasant hunting, different uh, – fly fishing, I taught myself how to do that, tying flies, all this kind of stuff just came from that, that realization that anything I wanted to do, I don't have to wait until somebody comes in and says, well, I'll show you how to do it. I can do it. And and really, it, it goes along with one of my biggest mottos is, are you the one setting the trends or are you just following other people's trends? I mean, if, if, you're, if your father never hunted and you want to hunt, are you going to set the new trend? And since then, all my brothers hunt. But they they probably would never have done that had I not stepped way out of my comfort zone and decided. And it's not to shed light on me. It's really just to say that if I would have just manned up and done it earlier, I probably could have had 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 more time out there. And if and if you want to, the listeners, if they want to do something, you don't have to wait until somebody's going to come in and help you do it. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, Tony. Um, now's the time that you get to share uh, 
where people can get a hold of you if you have a Facebook account or Twitter account and Instagram account uh, because I'm going to have to have you back because we've blown through uh, the segment of the show and, and we're going to have to have uh, uh, Tony Campisi uh, part two uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in the in the post show call which I'll do after you know we close this up but um, right. so why don't you just tell people how to get in touch with you or how to read your blog at this point in time. Right. Well, first of all, I'd be more than willing to come back and do it. Uh, a Tony Campisi part two. How you can get it in hold a hold of me, and I really, I really uh, would love to meet anybody who listened to this show. You can get a hold of me, Tony Campisi, T O N Y Campisi, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. You can find me on my blog at t campisi dot com. That's t the letter t c a m p i s i dot com you can read a lot more about the, about the pioneer lifestyle which is something that i truly truly believe in and i think that that should be it that's that's how you can find me online okay so facebook it's just under tony campisi yes sir yep twitter tony campisi yep instagram tony Camp- campisi you got it and youtube I bet it's Tony Campisi. You got it. (laughs) I figured I wouldn't change it on that one. (laughs) Hey, everything is Tony Campisi. This has been a joy, and I I knew it was going to be a special show because uh, this young man, I'm a little bit older than he is and, 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 and done down the road a little farther, but he's got a unique outlook on what we all care about, and that's um, the critters in the wild, but we're also conservationists. We're also people who uh, live in a certain way of life, and that's a, a life that sur- is surrounded or integrated with, uh, with nature. So on behalf of Whitetail Ron and Tony, thank you so much for being a guest today. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. As your host at Whitetail Rendezvous, I want to thank each and every one of you for spending your time with us today. I look forward to sharing with you in the next episode more whitetail hunting tips, techniques, and stories. Until then, keep the sun at your back, the wind in your face, and always be patient. If you have any tips, comments, or suggestions, or what we can do to improve because we're here to serve you, let us know. Thanks for listening to Whitetail Rendezvous podcast at www.whitetailrendezvous.com.